All right, let's talk about nucleic acids. So DNA and RNA are two examples, deoxyribonucleic acid for DNA and ribonucleic acid for RNA. Um, these are both types of macromolecules. Uh, we should probably know at this point that DNA is going to be that blueprint material that we hold inside of the nucleus. And when we want to express a gene, for example, what we do is we have an enzyme called RNA polymerase, which comes and unwinds our, or, yeah, unwinds our DNA, uses one strand as a template to write um, a disposable transcript RNA and send that outside of the nucleus to be picked up by a ribosome to make a protein of some sort. All right, so the monomer for our nucleic acids, we call those nucleotides. So our nucleotides are going to be composed of a pentose or five carbon sugar, some kind of nitrogenous base, and one to three phosphate groups. Now, if you're missing your phosphate groups, we call you a nucleoside. So here's a nucleotide. We have this five carbon sugar bound to a base, bound to a phosphate group. And again, if we are missing that phosphate group, we just call it a nucleoside. All right, so we have a few different types of nitrogenous bases. Um, if we're dealing with DNA, we have adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Those are the, the four letters of the uh, nucleic acid alphabet. So we have adenine here, guanine here. Both of those are purines. And then our cytosine and thymine here. Both of those are pyrimidines. Now if we're dealing with RNA, um, in place of thymine, RNA actually uses uracil, which is very structurally similar, um, but it is, in fact, different. So it's missing this methyl group here. So we call this uracil. And maybe as a reminder, you know, our adenine is going to bind to thymine uh, in DNA. Uh, if we're dealing with RNA, adenine would bind instead to uracil. And then... In both DNA and RNA, guanine is going to bind to cytosine, cytosine bind to guanine. If you remember apples and apples and trees, girls and cats. All right. So when we're building a strand of nucleic acids, what we need to do is link our phosphate, five carbon sugar backbone to one another. So in this case, we have one nucleotide. And we want to link this nucleotide to another nucleotide. And so what we have here, if you look here, we're removing a hydrogen, we're removing a hydroxyl group. We're actually creating a phosphodiester linkage here between these two nucleotides. And in order to make that, we undergo a condensation reaction, or you could even call it a dehydration synthesis reaction. Because if you look here, a hydroxyl plus a hydrogen is pretty much water. We're removing water from two molecules in order to fuse them together, to make a bond between them. And we call that type of bond a phosphodiester bond. The way I like to remember this is you can just look at this phospho, associate that with the phosphate, your phosphate group. That's going to be the only, um, out of all of the linkages between our uh, the monomers of our macromolecules, this is going to be the only one, uh, at least that we talk about, that contains a phosphate group. So phosphodiester bond links the two. So now this is just another, or this is a refresher, you could say a refresher of DNA structure. So here we have a phosphate, five carbon sugar, or a pentose. Then we have a phosphate, five carbon sugar, phosphate, pentose phosphate, pentose, and so on. So that composes the backbone. And remember, each of these nucleotides are linked via phosphodiester bonds. Now dangling down in the middle, you have your nitrogenous bases. So in this case, you have a thymine. And then its counterpart, adenine, is actually dangling on the other side. These guys are linked by hydrogen bonds. So just as a reminder, hydrogen bonds is going to involve a hydrogen, 
and that hydrogen is typically going to have a partial positive charge, and it's going to be drawn to the partial negative charge on a separate atom on a separate molecule. So here you have thymine bound to adenine linked by two hydrogen bonds, thymine bound to adenine linked by two hydrogen bonds, and then you have cytosine bound to guanine linked by three hydrogen bonds. And so as you can see here, this is DNA because it's not using uracil, it's using thymine instead. Okay. So uh, RNA, again, instead of thymine, it has a uracil in place of that. And just a, again, as a reminder, you're gonna have your DNA hanging out in your nucleus. If you wanna express a gene, or if, it is, if your cell is inspired to express a gene, what's gonna happen is RNA polymerase is gonna come and unwind this DNA and use one of these strands of DNA kind of a, as a template to write a disposable transcript of mRNA. So we, you undergo the process called transcription. And we're gonna be going over this in a lot more detail in the next section. Uh, but it's gonna make this substance called mRNA, messenger RNA. It's gonna send that outside of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm. Um, and it's gonna be picked up by a ribosome. And that ribosome, what it's gonna do is it's gonna translate that nucleotide language of mRNA into could say an amino acid uh, language of proteins. So it links a bunch of proteins, or sorry, amino acids together to make a protein. So here, you know, it's showing, or it's this is showing your double-stranded DNA, and here is a single strand of RNA. And again, in place of thymine, it has uracil. All right, so now we we have other roles of nucleic acids. So you could have nucleic acids that don't necessarily code for proteins or used as you know some kind of genetic blueprint. Um, we have things like ATP, which we've probably heard about, adenosine triphosphate. It's an energy-rich molecule that is used to conduct many cellular processes, such as when we bring glucose into our cells, what happens is we actually use ATP. So we, we use up ATP, we take away one of those phosphates and bind it to that glucose to make glucose 6-phosphate, and that actually kind of traps that glucose inside of the cell so it does not leave. Uh, we also have things like guanosine triphosphate. It's, uh, it's, another actu it, it's another energy source, but probably talked about much less. Um, we'll probably talk about it in the next section. It's involved in, you know, transcription, uh, translation, another energy-rich molecule. And then we also have things like cyclic adenosine monophosphate. So we know that AMP, adenosine monophosphate, is just, you know, your 5-carbon sugar bound to, uh, you know, your, your nitrogenous base, and then it has one phosphate. Well, cyclic AMP, if you see here, you have this phosphate, which is bound in two locations to that pentose, making it kind of cyclic in structure. And your cyclic AMP, which we'll talk about in the next section, or, or maybe I think it was section three, um, is, is used as a signaling molecule. So you, this is, this is a, a major player in a lot of your signal transduction pathways. You know, you have um, a receptor site on the surface of your cell and it binds to some kind of hormone well, eventually what happens is you end up producing, you know, cyclic AMP, which then signals to other molecules, which then signals to other molecules, and so on and so on, to create some kind of cellular response, whether it's gene expression or opening up a calcium channel, for example. All right.